This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 227, and it's funny, Ben, we were just saying before we started recording, you never really know what's going to get the attention, and lately, your hair and your trampoline have been getting lots of attention. Yep. People are very interested in my hair. <laughs> you don't know what to say to that. Um, anyway, so I got a story to share with you. I was in line last week with uh, my buddy Dave from Edmonton at a conference. So we're in the coffee line, and he says to me, so Dave and I ride our Peloton many Saturday mornings together. So this is like an idea for you. It might be of interest. So he's, he's pretty nerdy on numbers. So he was saying that what they do in their family, so him and his wife and his kids, Anytime they do a large purchase, they will take their label maker and put the amount they paid for that item and the date they bought it, put it on the label, and then put it discreetly on the item. So us being Peloton riders, he says, you know, I, I looked at the date, looked up my Peloton, looked at the date and the price I paid. He's got it now down to below like, I think it's below 250 per ride. So he does this. Now, arguably, this is really geeky. I'm not suggesting people do this, but it's interesting to keep track of the value you get out of an item that you choose to buy. So he's even broken down the Peloton like cents per calorie. Like you can go to extremes, of course. But he said it ends up becoming a good discussion with particularly your kids who say they really want something. They buy it. You go back three years later. Nobody remembers when they got it, what they paid for it. But at least you have a record of that. You say, okay, in hindsight, was that item worth what you paid for it? So he said it has had an impression on his family. I thought it was kind of a cool idea. That is a cool idea. I have that conversation with my kids all the time. They, they wanted a new toy recently that all, all, all the other kids at school had. And I reminded them, guys, like, go go look in your room. All of the toys that you really wanted, they end up in the same box within two weeks or something like that. So would you ever that go as cool far as, uh, as label labeling it? I don't know if I would. I, I, is, is he calculating the opportunity cost of not investing the money that could have been invested <laughs> instead of buying the Peloton, though? I don't know if that cost per ride number is accurate. Oh, this is just straight I'm line. Just, no, I'm, we're not doing, not comparing it to how to been invested. No, that's true. <laughs> but so many people you hear, oh, I bought one and now it's just like a, an expensive drying rack for my clothes. Yeah. Right? No, it's, an, it's a neat idea to keep track of your purchases. It's like a, it's like a way to audit. Like we talked to uh, Andrew Helm about that a while ago to take your credit card statement and go through your purchases and see if they made you happier or whatever. This is like a way of doing that, but keeping track of it over long periods of time by putting the cost on a physical object. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a neat idea. So you wanted to talk about the uh, financial literacy survey. Oh, yeah. So we, we have the Rational Reminder newsletter that we send out, I think, once a month, I think. True. And uh, I'm not sure how many people it goes out to, but maybe a thousand? I think so. Ish, something like that. Uh, so we included... We, we didn't do it. Uh, Angelica and Sandrin and the team did put the S&P Finlit quiz in the newsletter with like a Microsoft Forms link so that people could go and take it. And 137 people responded. And it's just kind of cool to see the results. Um, of course, these people responding to the Rational Reminder, to, to a quiz in the Rational Reminder newsletter are a little bit finance geekier than, than average. So the uh, unsurprising average score was 92% on the quiz, which is a wow. lot higher than the, the average in Canada, which is 68%. Um, so I wasn't surprised just based on the, the sample. Um, the, the lowest score of all the, the four question categories was question one, uh, which was 82% average score across the 137 people that, that took the quiz. That question is suppose over the next 10 years, the prices of the things you buy double if your income also doubles, would you be able to buy uh, less than you can buy today, more than you can buy today, or the same as you can, can buy today? And we got at least one comment back on this question. And I've heard this before, the first time we talked about this, maybe in a YouTube comment or something. Um, pe people say that the question is flawed because if your income doubles and prices double, your after-tax income will have fallen due to the progressive tax system. That's a really good thought, uh, but a lot of progressive tax systems, including 
Canada, they actually, in, and I don't think the question was even going for this level no. of complexity. It's overthinking. It, it's overthinking for the question for sure. But even if we, if let's, let's say we're going to overthink it. Uh, if you do overthink it, progressive tax systems typically increase their tax brackets with the consumer price index. So Canada does that um, once per year. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't know if that's why that was the lowest scoring question because it's a, maybe, maybe it's uh, somewhat unclear. Uh, it was just I- interesting to see though. And there's also some feedback on question number two regarding interest rates on a debt. And I think arguably that question could have been clear and put some time variance in that question. Arguably. But we again, had it's overthinking. We, it's, it's, we, yeah. we had this conversation. I think it, that, that question, it didn't include time in the question or the answers, which implies yeah. a single time period of undetermined yeah. time. Yeah. So I, I think that question's fine. Anyway. Again, it's overthinking, which may be typical of our audience too. So and I, I don't know if we've said this yet. We ha- We have... Uh, Professor Anna Maria Lusardi, who designed that Global Finlet quiz and is a, is a like the authority on financial literacy, uh, she, she's going to be a guest on the podcast coming up pretty soon. So maybe we can ask her. Excellent. Uh, speaking of financial literacy for November, which is Canada's Financial Literacy Month, the November sale in the merchandise store continues. So you spend $30 and you get 50% off talking sense cards. And oddly enough, Talking Sense cards are $30. So basically, you can buy the cards for half price, free shipping in North America, and free socks and a beverage cozy. So that goes until the end of November. So you have another week or so from the time this releases. All right, so coming up today, Ben, you're diving into who should own market cap funds. And you wanted to talk about tax loss selling, which is a pretty hot topic. And then we'll review for Financial Literacy Month five more books. I actually added a sixth which is a book I read this week, so another one snuck in. I'll take another crack at a 60-second episode review, see if I can keep it under a minute this time. And this one's our episode with Dave Getch. At the end, we'll just chat and talk about reviews and letters and connections and stuff. I think we, we, we added some news items since you wrote these bullet points, right? Yes, but they're in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. There's still there's no in there. I'm not middle spilling exists. all the candy in the lobby here. We got to have some surprises. Oh. But yes, there are some news stories. Today's a big day in the market, so maybe we can talk a bit about that too. Not that it's we want to be that current, but it's interesting to observe what's been happening. Hmm. What well, one, one other thing that I'll say now, as opposed to to later, is that we're we're thinking about a project where we uh, take most episodes and turn them into continuing education uh, courses where we would build a five or 10 question quiz. If you listen to the episode, you can fill out the quiz and we would get those quizzes accredited by probably FP Canada and IROC if you're in Canada uh, for CE credits. So if you listen to the episode and, and you require those types of credits, you could go and take these quizzes. We would charge some amount of money uh, to get a certificate for taking those quizzes. So we're gonna put a poll in the Rational Reminder community, just to, just to see if, if you're an advisor in Canada and those CE credits would be useful to you, uh, if you could please let us know, uh, that would be great. Beautiful. And with that, let's go to the episode. All right, let's jump into episode 227. Ben, kick it off. All right, so I want to talk about who, who should invest in market cap weighted index funds. I think it's a pretty interesting topic. And we're gonna we're gonna throw some clips in here from past guest episodes because it was it was really the uh, uh, Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Binsbergen conversation when they they talked about if you if you don't think you have any information you should just own the market and that was a pretty interesting argument for owning the market and then I started thinking back through past conversations we've had and there's a whole bunch of really good uh, clips I guess kind of from literally the best people in the world that you could ask this question to, uh, explaining who should just own the market. Uh, so I wanted to talk through that and then, and then, like I said, insert some of those clips in there. Uh, okay. So I have said, and we've said countless times that owning low cost total market index index funds is the most sensible way to invest for most people. And I, I think that's a true statement. Most people, whatever that means. And maybe we'll talk more about that. Um, but while that is a true statement, 
a, a true general statement. It's not, it's not actually that useful <laughs> because how do you know if you're like most people and if you're not like most people, how should you invest? How do you identify if you're different? And if you do identify that you're different from most people, how does that change how you should invest? So it's really answering that question, who, who should just own the market and who should do something a little bit uh, different? You've been thinking about this. Well, yeah. Because we've talked to, like, I mean, you go through the, the, the clips that I want to throw in here and there, we've got like some, a bit of Fama, a bit of John Cochran, uh, Birken Van Binsbergen. Uh, I don't know who else is in there. Oh, Sebastian Batermier. All, the, all these fascinating tidbits of those conversations that that answer pieces of this question. So yeah, I have been. <laughs> all right. I have been thinking about it. Uh, so you go back to Harry Markowitz, portfolio theory in the 1950s. And his modern portfolio theory concept is, is, is built on the basis that investors seek to minimize the variance in their portfolios for a given level of expected return or maximize their expected return for a given level of variance. Yep. Pretty standard portfolio theory stuff. Uh, the optimal set of risky portfolios are mean variance efficient. And the risky portfolio with the highest sharp ratio is called the tangency portfolio. This is stuff we've talked about before. Uh, anyone that's taken any level of finance classes has heard this. Uh, so in this theory, all investors optimally hold the tangency portfolio combined with a long or short position in the risk-free asset. Now, then we go to the CAPM. So that's Markowitz portfolio theory in the 1950s. CAPM in 1964, at least Sharp's, Sharp's iteration of it. Uh, the the, the CAPM model turns Markowitz portfolio theory into a testable prediction about the relationship between risk and expected return. So in the CAPM each asset's price is based on its contribution to the risk and expected return of the market portfolio. In an efficient market where investors are mean variance optimizers, all assets must be priced such that the market portfolio is the tangency portfolio. So under the assumptions of the CAPM, the market portfolio is the tangency portfolio. And remember in Markowitz portfolio theory, uh, inve all investors should want to own the tangency portfolio in CAPM, if, if CAPM describes expected returns, the market portfolio is the tangency portfolio. Therefore, everyone should just own the market. Um, the, now that, that, well, sort of. The, 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 the theoretical market portfolio includes all assets, right? Um, but the, the, the argument for index investing is kind of that while public stock and bond markets are a pretty good proxy for the market portfolio, even if they're not the true theoretical market portfolio. So you, you, we can stop there. And this is like bogleheads. We're done. This is where bogleheads stop. Uh, everyone should own the market. There's, there's no other risk premiums. Mean variance is optimal. At least this is the theoretical justification to be a boglehead. Bogleheads, I'm sure, have other reasons like simplicity and, and costs, which we will, which we will talk about. Uh, so that, that's it. The, the advice at this point in the theory is just own own total market stock and bond index funds. You're done. Um, now, the, the, the CAPM, of course, was a huge breakthrough in financial economics. It was the first model we had to relate risk and expected return. And it's a, it's a beautiful theory. Uh, I think Fama talked about how much he likes it and how he he uh, w wishes that the, the, the other factors could be disproved so that we could just use the CAPM. <laughs> Um, but of course, they, they haven't been disproved and it's been the other way around where the CAPM has a whole bunch of empirical uh, empirical flaws. Um, if in addition to portfolio variance, investors also care about how their portfolio behaves relative to other states of the world, it's reasonable to believe that expected returns would deviate from their CAPM predictions. So that brings us to the ICAPM. Uh, that's where Robert Merton had the his 1973 paper, uh, the, the ICAM, I, ICAPM considers a multi-period investor. I didn't mention that for the CAPM. The CAPM considers a single period investor. The ICAPM considers a multi-period investor who, in addition to mean and variance, is concerned with the covariance of their portfolio with other stuff like labor income, uh, the prices of consumption goods, and future expected returns. Because now we're worrying about multiple periods instead of a single period. So if your uh, returns in one period affect your returns in the next period, that matters to multi-period or long-term investors, which is different from CAPM. 
uh, I, I cap M investors still care about optimizing for the mean and variance of their portfolios, but they're willing willing to accept a little bit more variance or a little bit less expected return. ICAP investors are still concerned with optimizing mean and variance, but they're willing to accept a little more variance or a little less expected return if their portfolio is not sensitive to states of the world that they're concerned about. So that's that the, the covariance thing. Um, now, the, the existence of multiple price risks, multiple priced risks, materially changes the logic of market cap weighted index funds being universally optimal for all investors. Remember, with cap M pricing, the market portfolio is the tendency portfolio, and we can all go home. Uh, in the I cap M, the market portfolio is no longer the tangency portfolio. The market portfolio in the I cap M is the multi-factor efficient portfolio. Uh, hopefully, people understand what that means. It's like it's got the the right combination of of uh, mean variance and covariance exposure to other other states of the world. For the for the average investor, but if you're the mean variance investor, you can't just you can't just buy the market anymore. Um, so in in the case of the ICAP M, rather than a single theoretically optimal portfolio for all investors, there's like literally infinite optimal portfolios where optimal is different for each investor, right? Based on how the characteristics of the investor match up with the characteristics of the portfolio, uh, there's we we can no longer say there's an objectively optimal. Uh, portfolio. It depends on the investor. That's ICAP M uh, thinking. Now, in, investors can differ in their willingness and ability to accept covariance with bad states of the world. Um, the market portfolio is still totologically optimal for the average investor. It has to be, but it's suboptimal for everyone else. <laughs> this is where it gets kind of tricky, right? Uh, if you're not the average investor, you shouldn't own the market portfolio. Um, the, the, the market portfolio with ICAP M pricing uh, combines the mean variance efficient portfolio with, this is what I was talking about with multi-factor efficient, uh, it combines the mean variance efficient portfolio with the portfolios that tend to perform well in bad states of the world uh, that most investors are, are worried about. The hedge portfolios trade off lower expected returns for lower covariance with bad states of the world. Now that's good for the average investor because it hedges against to just just to the right amount hedges against the risks that the average investor is concerned about. But the 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 problem for some investors is that multi-factor efficiency of the market portfolio means that the market portfolio delivers the perfect mix of the mean variance optimal portfolio and the multi-factor hedge portfolios for the average investor. But again, I, I think I'm repeating myself here. The if you're not the average investor, those exposures to the hedge portfolios may not be optimal. Maybe there's not enough. Maybe there's too much. And then one of the big takeaways from, from that whole thing is that if, if you're the me and variance investor, because they can still exist. If you're an investor that doesn't care about covariances with other states of the world, you can still be a me and variance investor. But again, if, if that is you, if, if you're, if you're not exposed to the risks that the average investor is worried about owning the market portfolio is suboptimal because it's multi-factor efficient. The mean variance portfolio is still in there, but it's mixed in with a bunch of hedge hedge portfolios that you may not want to own if your goal is mean variance efficiency. Uh, okay, so to, to, to re reiterate a little bit, if you are the average investor, if you're, sensitive, if you're sensitive to the same common risks as the average investor, which is probably a better way to say it, nobody can know who's the average investor, who knows, but if you're sensitive to the same common risks as the average investor or you have the same sensitivities, to those risks, you should hold the market portfolio. Uh, but if you have more or less sensitivity to the risk that most investors are worried about, then your portfolio should be different, at least in the theory. Uh, John Cochran gave us a nice explanation of this back in episode 169. Uh, given that the market portfolio is optimal for the average investor, how do you decide if you are different from average? So we'll go to a clip from him talking about that for, for a few minutes. Why should you, with this great insight, do something different from everybody else? Well, you might be genuinely smarter than everybody else. You might be genuinely better informed than other people. Good luck to you on that one. Uh, you certainly might have a different uh, ability to take risk. So uh, you might want to be an insurance company um, and, and simply say, well, I, uh, you know, the average investor is somebody who, who has started a business and made a lot of money in it but they still own a business. 
So they're, if they're doing their jobs right, they're thinking hard about integrating their business risk and their portfolio risk. So uh, in a time when you know the average person, like December 2009, or Mar- I guess March 2009 was the all-time buying opportunity that I didn't take. And I can tell you guys didn't take either because you're still working for a living or, or whatever. But uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, if you can spot that everybody else is, they are really worried about the risk to their business. And so they're dumping, even though they understand this is probably a good time to buy. Um, then that's, and you know, but you're a tenured professor or you're retired, you can afford to take a risk that you understand other people want to get rid of. You're probably going to get paid a premium to do it. Actually, uh, March 1934, uh, if you can go back in, if you can get a time machine, Go back to March 1934. That was the all-time bottom of the Great Depression. Uh, That was the greatest single month in stock returns ever. Uh, And and so you want to buy February 1934. Go back and and tell great-grandfather to buy. Uh, Because, and, you know, there's some, you know, the depths of the Great Depression. There was, and there was, you're still taking risk. There was a good chance that uh, America turned fascist and socialist. Uh, and communist in the middle of the Great Depression. There was a good chance that we lost World War II. There's all sorts of risks there, You're, but it, it was a good bet. <laughs> uh, so um, if you can, I think the best one is if you can identify your ability to take risk as different from other people, that justifies uh, buying. And uh, most importantly, now here's here's where we get a little fluffy. Which stocks do you buy? Hmm. Do you buy value stocks, growth stocks, momentum stocks? Which industries do you invest in? How do you avoid the good stock versus good company fallacy? Um, <laughs> uh, I think there, uh, understand if you could understand uh, what risks are uh, in different categories of stocks, who is buying them, who is better served to taking them. I, I, th- I think that is probably the, the great. So the market timing happens slowly, but the uh, the uh, sector allocation, the the style allocation, that's that's something that. You can do it different times. And I, I think understanding your risk bearing of capacity relative to you know various sector styles and factors would be really the way to think about that. I don't have good answers about that. No one has good answers about that. Uh, the, the one I would say is don't invest in your own company. Right. Don't invest in your own industry, <laughs> uh, be, which is the, one of the biggest mistakes people make. They load up on their own company. Even the, the geniuses at long-term capital management have borrowed money to invest in their own company. Come on, guys. Uh, you, you don't want to do that. That That is just multiplying risks. Um, so we can start always start with don't pay too many taxes and risk management. Uh, those are zero. Those are completely free. free. Uh, you don't need to chase alpha for that. It's not a zero sum game. And one of the aspects of risk management is, uh, you know, even though everybody thinks their own industry is the industry of the future, even the coal people thought that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, keeping enough money out of the wonderful rewards of your own industry and your own company so that if things go bad, you can uh, survive is uh, that's a classic example of, of this kind of thinking about heterogeneity. Even if even if your company is a great company and mm-hmm. you, you think it's a great return opportunity, it might not work out. The FTC could decide that you're a monopoly and 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 destroy it. <laughs> Uh, or or the or the um, SEC could decide you do you contribute too much to climate change and destroy it. So uh, even if you think it's a great opportunity, uh, you should be investing less in it than the average person because you are exposed to that risk. And, and if we could if we can make that case more generally for factor risks, I think we would have a much better framework for understanding who should invest in factor risks. And- that was a great clip from from John, and, and I, I also want to go to quickly a, a very concise version of that answer to, the, to, the, to a similar question from Gene Fama in episode 200. Add, attitudes towards different dimensions. I think of them as different dimensions of risk, but attitudes to different dimensions of risk are um, what do it. You know, in Merton's perspective, it's basically our attitude towards these, whatever these underlying state variables are that generate premiums in various dimensions. Okay, so if you're not exposed to any common risks outside of your portfolio, that, that is you don't depend on labor income, you don't own a business, or otherwise have sensitivity to economic risk outside of your portfolio returns, 
or if you're willing to load up more on the risks that you're already exposed to, that's another important thing there, uh, you, you might be a mean variance investor. Um, but it's important to remember, and again, I'm, I'm repeating myself, I, 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 I get a little bit too excited about mean <laughs> variance efficiency. Uh, There's a the, sentence the, 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 that has the, never been said before. In the history of I'm finance. Sure, <laughs> I'm sure Bill Sharp has said that before. Oh, maybe. <laughs> or, or Harry Markowitz. It's still funny. Uh, yeah, right. So the, 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 the market portfolio is not mean variance efficient. It's multi-factor efficient. I think I've said that enough times. Uh, a, a mean variance investor who only cares about risk and expected return has to tilt toward the multi-factor hedge uh, or, or tilt away from the multi-factor hedge portfolios in the market portfolio. Now, the ICAPM, of course, does not define the states of the world that most investors are concerned about. It, it refers to them just as unknown state variables. And I, I loved the comment that Fama gave us when I tried to dig into that. Like, and is there any way we can know uh, what those state variables are? So I, I just want to play that real quick. It's, it's less than a minute. Well, <laughs> possible in what sense, though? I mean, can you go into their minds and... And, and take out what what dimensions of returns are of special interest or are of disinterest. Mm. What what things do they have positive taste for, and what things do they have negative taste for, and are those tastes general? I mean, does, does everybody have positive taste for one thing and negative taste for another? So it's not that easy, you know. Okay. Paul Burton is one of the smartest guys, if not the smartest guy, I've ever known. And he didn't even attempt to do it. He did not even take a crack at it. He just gave us the mathematical framework and said, run with it, guys. <laughs> All right. So those, the, the state variables are un, unknowable, um, again, with, with Fama's version of humor there. Uh, but th this is where Fama and French's 1993 paper, Common Risk Factors in the Returns on Stocks and Bonds, is, is important. That's when they took the empirical evidence that small cap and low priced stocks uh, are unexplained by market risk using using the cap M uh, as the model. Uh, and they suggest that these stocks may reflect sensitivity to unknown state variables that produce non-diversifiable risk. So they're basically saying, we don't know what the state variables that people are worried about are, but these portfolios seem to be sensitive to those things, whatever it is that they may, that they may be. Uh, now, if we look at some of Sebastian Batermier's stuff, in, in, well, it, this is actually not even him, him yet. Um, these are other empirical papers on whether value stocks are riskier in, in different times. So if, if you look at the empirical data, value stocks tend to be under distress, have high financial leverage, face substantial uncertainty in future earnings. They also tend to be riskier than growth stocks in bad economic times and only slightly less risky in good times. And they deliver low returns when labor income and consumption fall. So from an ICAPM perspective, you can see a pretty good argument for why we would call value stocks uh, riskier, why we call them sensitive to states of the world that, that a lot of people are worried about. So based on that, we might expect, as, as the theory predicts, that, that investors with high human capital and high exposure to macroeconomic risk would tilt their portfolios toward growth stocks, which act as a hedge portfolio based on what we were just talking about. Uh, and then this is where the Sebastian Batermier stuff comes in, uh, in their paper, Who Are the Value and Growth Investors?, they find in a representative sample of approximately 70,000 Swedish households that households progressively shift from growth stocks to value stocks as they become older and their balance sheets improve. It's like you couldn't ask for a better, uh, it, it, better empirical evidence supporting the, just the ICAPM version of why we see differences in returns. Uh, they also find in their research that investors with high human capital and high exposure to macroeconomic risk tilt their portfolios away from value stocks. And then again, of course, that's consistent with the uh, greater hedging demands of younger and less wealthy investors and older, wealthier investors tending to look more like the theoretical mean variance investor. Uh, now, I, I do want to just go quickly to a clip where Sebastian explains their results to us back in episode 196. We had asked him what causes people in their sample to increase their value tilts over time. We think it's a mix of effects. It's a strong result. And oftentimes when you have a strong result like that, you have multiple drivers coming on. Hmm. To tease apart the multiple possible channels that could explain that migration, we create an econometric model uh, where we are going to regress or see how that value tilt 
corresponds or can be explained by a number of characteristics, like age, the balance sheet strength, gender, human capital, and so forth. What we'll find is that in general, age explains about 60% of the migration. Here, financial theory says that growth stocks, they may be risky in the short run, but they tend to be safer over the long run. So a lot of their risk comes from transitory price shocks, which you may not face as much over the long run. So they make more sense for younger folks with a long horizon, right? And so as they age, well, that, that benefit diminishes as the horizon gets closer. And so uh, that can explain part of the shift toward the, the value tilt. Another driver is human capital. Uh, we believe that human capital explains about 20% of the migration. So that's 60, 20, or 80% here. Here, financial theory um, says something else as well. It says that value stocks, in addition to the, the horizon effect we just talked, value stocks end up being more exposed to bad recessions. These are stocks with low market value relative to book. Um, there's few growth options left in them. Uh, they tend to have more leverage. They tend to have more operating leverage, more fixed costs. So they have a harder time adjusting their production model during bad times. So they may be more exposed to default in times of bad recessions. And so when you're looking at the cross-section of individuals, you have younger folks, older folks. The younger folks have the bulk of their wealth invested in human capital, little financial wealth, whereas uh, among retirees, it tends to be primarily financial wealth. And so the, the younger folks uh, may want uh, to, to hedge away from that risk. And part of that means, well, not tilt as much toward these stocks as some of the other investors. And then the third driver, which we believe explains about 20% of the migration. So we're at 60, 20, 20, what 100 now? So the remaining 20% is the strength of your balance sheet. Again, going back to the concept of the composition of wealth, when you're young, we find that the bulk of your wealth is in your human capital. It's in real estate, but it's very levered at that point, right? So you have some financial wealth, but your cushion is fairly small. Um, there's also a lot of liabilities. There's the mortgage. You may have uh, liabilities through your, your kids and other types of student loans that might remain. Um, whereas when you're more mature, you tend to have accumulated more financial wealth uh, and you don't have as much liabilities. And by the time you're 60, 65, typically the mortgage is being paid, right? And so these individuals have more bandwidth to, to take some of those risks and they're not as exposed to those bad recessions as the younger folks. And so again, it makes sense to tilt toward value um, if you have a stronger balance sheet and you can afford uh, to bear these shocks. Okay, so as a theory, the ICAPM solves a lot of the empirical problems that the CAPM suffers from. One of the big takeaways is that you, if you are not the average investor, the market portfolio, which again, we can easily proxy with low cost total market index funds is not the theoretically optimal portfolio for you. Investors who are more willing or more able to take on the risks that the average investor wants to avoid should theoretically tilt their portfolios away from the multi-factor hedge portfolios and toward the assets more exposed to or more sensitive to the risk that the average investor wants to avoid. So cool, that's ICAPM theory. You're, you should be different from the market. Your, your portfolio should look different from the market if you're different from the average investor. And that's where we get this idea of, hey, there are, there are other priced risks out there. And if you want higher re expected returns on a risk-adjusted basis, if you, want, if you want to be the mean variance investor, you should be tilting toward right. these riskier securities. That's the whole idea. That doesn't mean everyone should be doing it. This is, this is kind of like a, like a, like a different, because we did that, that, that episode a while ago on, on is factor investing worth it? And I don't think we talked much about this theoretical side. We just talked about differences in expected returns. Right. So that was kind of like given, given that you are a mean variance investor, is factor investing worth it? <laughs> But it's not given that you are a mean variance investor. I think that's that's one of the things that gets lost when people start talking about factor investing. Everyone wants to act like they're a mean variance investor, but not everybody is, and not everybody should be. Um, okay, 
So we, we got the ICAP M theory. Uh, I, I think as much as that's cool theoretically, and as much as what I just said makes makes sense that you, if, if you want to be a mean variance investor, you have to be different from the market. In practice, it's not quite as clean as it sounds. It's it's there, there's 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 something there, but it's not as clean as it sounds. So so Fama and French, they they gave their their handful of risk factors. They've got their five factor model now. Uh, which is an empirical model, as as Fama told us when he was on our podcast. It's like, what did he say? It's like the it's got a very very light theoretical touch to it, but it's it's a empirical model. Uh, and, and there's no census on uh, there's no consensus on what the true pricing factors are. What 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 variables really proxy for the states of the world that most investors are concerned about? We don't really know. There are hundreds of factors in the in the literature, so I think given that uncertainty, and are we targeting the right uh, stuff? Um, a- a- every time that you trade, you could be losing to a skilled active manager. So this is when, when I mentioned uh, Jonathan Burke and Jules Van Binsberg, and this is what they they got me thinking about on on this topic. There, there's always someone on the other side of the trade. Um, if if it turns out that what we thought were riskier stocks are really just noise in the data or, or we're using the wrong variable or whatever, you could end up on the wrong side of, of the trade. Um, and I mean, I, I think we have enough information to target higher expected returns, obviously, maybe. Uh, but this is still an interesting angle to think about. So owning owning the market, just owning the whole market, is a hedge against being misinformed. You You buy it once and you forget it. Tilting toward riskier stocks requires more trading because like the relative riskiness of stocks uh, changes over time. Uh, a more targeted index or a more targeted fund like a like a dimensional or an Aventus, they've got to trade more often. They've got to reconstitute more often. If you look at the turnover in, the type, in those types of portfolios compared to a total market index, the turnover is going to be higher yep. for anything targeting riskier securities. Uh, and each trade is, is an opportunity to be misinformed. So I want to go to the clip of Jonathan Burke giving us his thoughts on on this in episode 220. Yeah, so this is, I think, a very important point. I mean, we obviously emphasize it when we teach finance, but I think that in general, this is not emphasized enough, which is if you are trading, anytime you trade and you don't have information, if the other side of the person has information, you, you lose. Right, that's the nature of the game. If somebody has more information than you and you trade with them, you're on the losing side. So the extent to which that that if you know you don't have information and, and you know there is information out there, what you want to do is don't trade. Right? And the way you don't trade is you buy the market portfolio. You buy it once, you hold it, and you sell it. And if you so I, I, actually it's more subtle than that. It's not just don't trade. But why the market? Why not just any portfolio? The reason why the market is particularly good is you're buying it in the economy-wide weights. You're not emphasizing any stock. Somebody with information is going to emphasize some stock over another stock. If you're on the other side of that trade, that means you have the opposite. You're doing exactly opposite to them and you will lose. So what you want to make sure is you're never exactly opposite of somebody with information. How do you do that? You just buy the market because the market, you're not opposite to anything. You're in the weights of the whole economy. Okay. So I, I think that's an important counter argument to being different from the market. Um, but like I said, before we went to the clip with Jonathan, uh, well, there are hundreds of document documented risk factors out there. there there's there's a, a, at least one paper, the 2022 paper that we've talked about, about before. Is there a replication crisis in finance? Uh, they find that all those many, many factors that are out there, they really boil down to 13 main themes. And the majority in, 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 the, in this paper, uh, the majority uh, they find are significant parts of the tangency portfolio. Um, so, I, I mean, we... We don't have perfect information. We can't because, well, I mean, the state variables are unknowable, like Fama made me laugh about. Um, we don't have perfect information about differences in expected returns or how to proxy sensitivity to, to risks or whatever. But I think we have pretty good information. Um, 
pretty good. But even then, even, even if we have pretty good information, being different from the market also introduces monitoring costs. The market portfolio, it, it is what it is. It's easy to see if you're getting what you paid for if, when you invest in a total market ETF. Uh, and, and you see this too with like, if you buy a total market fund from iShares or Vanguard, the returns are going to be the same, basically. But if you buy a value fund from iShares or Vanguard or Dimensional or Avantis, vastly different. Vastly different characteristics, vastly different returns, ex post. It's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a whole different situation. Uh, so when you're tilting toward riskier stocks, there's more oversight required for, to, to know whether the fund is, is delivering what you expected, doing so efficiently, uh, and to know whether you're targeting the right risks, which of course is not knowable um, ex ante, which, which adds to the whole monitoring problem. Uh, y- your life is just a lot easier when you just own the market through low cost index funds, even if it is theoretically suboptimal. Like even if you said, I, I can identify myself as a mean variance investor, whether that's through preferences for risk or your financial situation or whatever, it's still not crazy to say, I don't want to have the, I don't want to risk being wrong. I don't want to have the monitoring costs. I'm just going to own total market index funds. Yep. And the monitoring costs, that was another argument from, uh, from Jonathan and, and Jules. Uh, okay. So to summarize, who should invest in total market index funds? The market portfolio, which again, we can proxy with total market index funds is optimal for the average investor. It's multi-factor efficient. So if you are the average investor, which of course we can't know, but you could decide, you could decide, you know what? I think I am the average investor. And then, uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's the best way to identify self-identify as the average investor. Self-identify as average. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you're average, you can, you can rest easy knowing that the best portfolio for you is total market index funds. And that's it. If you're different from average, which I, I mean, most people have to be, <laughs> not everybody can be average. That's, that's how, that's how it works. Uh, the theoretically optimal portfolio requires tilting the, the, the theoretically optimal portfolio doesn't mean it's what you should do, but if you're following por- portfolio theory, uh, the, the theoretically optimal portfolio requires tilting toward or away from the securities in the market that hedge against bad states of the world. Uh, an investor who wants to achieve the highest sharp ratio while ignoring portfolio covariance with bad states of the world. So the investor that wants to be a mean variance investor And there are a lot of those out there. I think everybody wants to be a mean variance investor. Maybe they need to hear about the ICAPM. (laughs) ICAPM is not nearly as exciting as mean variance optimization, I don't think. Um, But an an investor who wants that, who wants to to have the highest sharp ratio possible, uh, they, they, they can't just invest in the market. You can't invest in the market and expect mean variance efficiency. Uh, because the market portfolio is multi-factor efficient, but it is not mean variance efficient. Now, I, again, I'm, again, I'm repeating myself here, but even, even if you know how you're different from average, which of course is very difficult to, to do and difficult to measure, we don't have precise information about which assets are truly sensitive to the unknown state variables uh, that you may or may not be concerned about. So e- e- even then, even if you had a way to say, I'm this much different from average, okay, now what do you tilt toward or away from? <laughs> we don't have perfect information there. So if you want to minimize the risk of trading on bad information, owning the total market portfolio accomplishes that. That's the, the hedge against being misinformed. I think there are worse positions to take than just saying I'm going to own the market. But I also think that we have, that we have, we have a lot of pretty good information about differences in expected returns. It's, it's maybe worth thinking about it in, in, in building a portfolio. And then the last thing to, to consider is if you don't want to spend time monitoring your portfolio, monitoring the performance of your portfolio and the managers that you're choosing, like if you're choosing a Dimensional or an Avantis or a Vanguard or an iShares or whatever to get exposure to value stocks or, or whatever it may be, there's a lot more oversight required uh, ongoing for that. So there's, there's a cost there somewhere. I don't know how you measure it, but there's a cost in there. Uh, so if you don't want to, do that and worry about it, then total market index funds are hard to argue against. Um, even if they're identifiably theoretically optimal on other, on other measures or for other, uh, for other reasons. 
That was great. Did it answer the question? Do we know who should uh, who should invest yeah, in total market index framework? That was great. Um, jump to the news of the week. Boy, there's a lot going on yep. this week. Oh, I mean, you and I yeah. exchange stories often in the evening, and like this week, you can hardly keep up with what's going on. Yeah, I know. Like crazy. The, this crypto stuff with FTX. That's where you wanted to start. It's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So this was. At the time of recording this week, uh, at the time of this episode airing last week, but yeah, one of the largest crypto exchanges, FTX, uh, they had some liquidity problems. I'm not going to try and dig into the whole story, but um, they had some liquidity problems. They tried to do a deal to sell to Binance, which is the, the largest crypto exchange. And that alone was crazy because they were these guys were like arch rivals, uh, Sam Bankman Freed and and CZ, uh, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. That's how he writes his name. Spelled, yeah, yeah. Um, but they, they they were having this this kind of ongoing uh, rivalry, uh, and then Sam Bankman Fried says he's going to sell to Binance, and I was like, what? That was nuts. And then Binance decided not to do the deal. And I, you know, I can't say that I predicted this, but. When you see the tweets going back and forth between the two guys, I, I just thought I thought to myself like, "Oh my goodness, I bet you they're going to do due diligence," because it said pe- like pending due diligence, and I was like, "I bet they're going to go to due diligence and, and they're not going to do the deal." And then sure enough, I don't know, it was the next day or a couple of days later, um, Binance comes out and says they're not going to do the deal after going through uh, FTX's financials. So now FTX is in big, big trouble. Um, that that that's it's watching it unfold is going to be fascinating. I mean, maybe by the time this episode of Odo's out, maybe we'll know more. We don't know a ton at the moment. Uh, Sam Bankman Fried, the owner of FTX, was previously a billionaire and getting all sorts of titles like the next Warren Buffett and stuff like that. Well, he um, said in an interview, I think it was relayed somewhere that he wanted to buy Goldman. He, he speculated he might buy Goldman Sachs at some point in the future. Yeah, Something like that. There's all kinds of quotes There's like a that. Whole lot of confidence going on there, and maybe it was justified and and whatever. But he also it, owns it, a big chunk of Robinhood. Yep, yep. And and he's big in crypto. Like FTX was was the exchange that he had, but he also had Alameda Research, which was a derivatives uh, trading uh, yep. entity. Yeah. So big big deal in crypto. Um, Anyway, so my understanding is that he was he was previously worth sixteen or seventeen billion dollars, and now he's no longer a billionaire. Uh, I don't know how accurate that is, but that's what I've been seeing. Um, so be a big, big mess. And th- there's been a bunch of very good uh, articles written on what happened, kind of step by step, or what we think happened. Uh, so I'm, we're not going to go into that here, but it, it's it's fascinating to read about. It was fascinating to watch. It's just like the. I don't know the, the 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 type of finance drama that uh, happens in unregulated markets, I guess. Um, and then the other thing in crypto that happened is that the uh, U.S. Department of Justice recovered fifty thousand six hundred and seventy six bitcoins that were stolen from the Silk Road by a hacker in two thousand twelve. So the hackers stole bitcoins in two thousand twelve, um, according to to the Department of Justice. Uh, post about this the hacker did a whole bunch of complex transactions to try and cover their tracks the details of how they track them down aren't there but they did so you know it's it's just interesting to see that i mean when nobody is under the illusion at this point i don't think that bitcoin's anonymous everybody understands that that's not how it works but the fact that they were able to link this guy's wallet address to him as him as an individual and sees all of his assets, his crypto assets and his non-crypto assets, because they were ill-gotten, is, uh, I don't know. Are these the ones that were found in the popcorn can? Yeah. Some of them were, yeah. There was a floor safe and and the bottom of a popcorn tin. That's where I guess the hard drives must have been, or the the cold storage wallets. Yeah. Yeah. But, like, and this is what happens, right? Law enforcement catches up with, with stuff. That's... That's what that's what happens. Uh, yeah, so very very interesting week for for crypto. And then you wanted to talk about Amazon. Interesting observation: Amazon 
became the first company to lose or drop by a trillion dollars in market cap. Yeah. I wasn't that, I remember it was, I don't know, a year ago or something that we were talking about uh, Microsoft and Amazon on the, the race to a trillion dollars. Who's going to be the first to get to a trillion dollar market cap? And uh, now Amazon's made history as the first company to lose a trillion dollars, which is, which speaks of the size of the company. Yeah, right? you, you put these notes in before today's market moves. So we're recording this the afternoon of, of November 10th. So the market's about to close here. And Amazon today, just as an observation, is up almost 12%. And it's now approaching a market cap of a trillion dollars again. But you're talking about Crazy. a loss drop of a trillion dollars. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it was also interesting to look at Facebook or, or, or Meta. Uh, it seems like it's solidly a value stock at this point. I was looking at the holdings of the uh, dimensional U.S. vector and the Avantis U.S. large value products, and uh, Meta is a pretty sizable holding in both of those. So it's, uh, I think it's become a value stock. Yeah, so they announced layoffs, was it yesterday or today, that are coming up? So the market seems to be re reacting positively to that, up 11% as of right now. I think I've seen some people say that the PE ratio is in like the seven, eight range, I believe. Crazy. Crazy. Yep. And I remember again, like it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about the FANG stocks and then these seemingly invincible companies that just kept going up in price and debating uh, amongst ourselves and with our listeners whether there, it, it was a, a winner-take-all market where these companies, due to their network effects, were just going to keep getting bigger and, and the returns were going to keep being higher and higher. And we were saying, probably not. Yeah. Another yeah, big move today is in fixed income. I don't know if you've seen this or not, Ben, but I guess the CPI numbers came out today and inflation was less than expected. Therefore, the market, I guess, the story I read is that they figured the interest rates increases in the future may not be as great. Therefore, bonds, prices have gone up, yields have come down. So we have like a 2% move right now in the, the bond universe in Canada in the XBB ETF. Just shows you're gonna well, happen we, so fast. Yeah, yeah, we were talking before we started recording about how like we're glad to be in our seats, like we're glad to be in in the market on a day like today. Imagine trying to have timed everything going on in, in the market right now. Like you you miss it's that whole thing about if you miss that best day or whatever, you completely blow up your yeah your return. But I think that's this is one of those days. Like small value right now is up five and a half percent. You miss that, that's an expensive miss, right? Even the Dow it's is up three and a half. Expensive. TSX is up three and a half. Yep. A lot of names are up a lot to more capture than premiums. That. Yeah, you got to be there to capture. But the bonds premiums. too. It's bond, same thing for fixed income. Absolutely. All right, tax loss harvesting. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I we already did our main topic kind of, but there was this paper in the <laughs> Financial Analyst Journal. It was, it was a twenty twenty one paper uh, on loss harvesting, but but it takes a different approach. We, we, we talked about a paper back in episode 158 that was a 2020 paper in the Financial Analyst Journal, but I came across this one and I, I just thought it was interesting enough to, uh, to talk about on the, on the podcast. They, they mostly look at loss harvesting through the lens of direct indexing programs, uh, but they also touch on using funds as an alternative. Uh, so they were looking at, and then this is what made this paper unique. They're looking at loss harvesting outcomes sorted by investor profiles. And they base those profiles on the U.S. Survey of Consumer Finances. So they sort investors into types based on a handful of variables, which I'll, I'll talk through. Uh, so loss, loss offsetting income to taxable equity, which they state as a ratio, LOI over EQ. Uh, that, that's a, a very important metric to sort investors on because you need to have capital gains to use to offset your capital losses. If you do a loss harvest, and you have no taxable gains in Canada in that year or the previous th three years, there's no point to doing the loss <laughs> the harvest, or the, at least there's no immediate benefit to doing it. Uh, so if there's a cost to loss harvesting, uh, you, you probably wouldn't do it unless you had those gains available. In the US, it's a bit different. You can use losses to offset $3,000 of regular income per year. In Canada, you generally can't do that. Uh, there, there's some cases for small business corporations where you can, but that's not super relevant for this. Uh, then they grouped people by, or investors by, uh, quarterly new cash flows into the portfolio. So when you're contributing, you're always buying new shares, which affects your adjusted cost base. If you invest a lump sum and walk away, 
after, I don't know, a year or two years or something, there might be no losses in the portfolio. So again, there's no point in, or there's no ability to, to do loss harvesting. Whereas if you're contributing 10% to the portfolio value per year or something like that, you're always resetting your adjusted cost base and potentially creating loss harvesting opportunities. Uh, then they looked at the 15 year liquidation of the portfolio and they ranged that from 75% liquidation in the type one investor, which is supposed to be representative of like a mass affluent investor, um, to 0% for a type four investor, which is like the ultra high net worth, uh, in their, in their archetypes. Uh, the, the idea is that at a lower net worth, the investor is more likely to need to liquidate more of their portfolio for consumption. Whereas an ultra high net worth investor is not going to have to liquidate. Uh, and then the last thing they sorted by were the tax rates. So the harvest tax rate, uh, and the spread between the harvest and the liquidation tax rate. So if you can harvest at a very high tax rate today, which decreases your adjusted cost basis. So you're saving tax at a higher rate today, but you're also increasing your, or, or, or decreasing your adjusted cost basis, which increases your future tax liability. Right. And then you sell at a much lower tax rate in the future. That's the best possible outcome for tax loss harvesting. For sure. But if the, if the current tax rate's not very high, then there's not a whole lot of immediate benefit. And if the spread between current and future tax rates is not very large, then a lot of that, uh, a lot of the deferral benefit uh, goes away. You get less of a bonus on the tax rate spread, I guess, if the spread is uh, small. Uh, so in a base case estimate, uh, using standard assumptions, like the same assumptions that other, other papers have used, uh, which is no, uh, no limit on offsetting income. So they assume that you always have capital uh, gains to offset with the losses. And they assume no liquidation in this base case. Uh, so in, in that case, they find a 104 basis point tax alpha, uh, which is similar to other papers and very similar to the paper that we talked about uh, in episode 158. Uh, but then by group, so in the type one group, which is the mass affluent group, they find the estimate of uh, at 24 basis points, which is less than the fee on most direct index indexing programs. Uh, and then in the type four group, which is the ultra high net worth group, they find a much larger 191 basis point tax alpha. Uh, but a big input there is the spread between current and future tax rates, which they had at 17%. And they also had a higher hmm. uh, initial tax rate. Now in Canada, so for a US investor, maybe this is super relevant. In Canada, a high net worth investor is gonna have a tax spread of zero, assuming no changes, no major changes in tax rate on harvest and liquidation. You're always gonna be at the highest marginal tax rate and the capital gains rate is always the same. So there's no spread. Uh, and in Canada, the initial tax rate is also lower than what they're using in their model. Uh, then they, they looked at the effect of the return environment uh, or what uh, actually the old paper that we uh, t discussed, the 2020 paper, what they, they refer to this as generational luck. Like depending on the sequence of returns that you happen to get over your investment period, there's going to be an effect on the efficacy of tax loss harvesting as a strategy. So we call it generational luck. Uh, a, a big portion of the tax loss harvesting alpha in this sample is explained by that, by the return environment that you happen to get, which is completely outside of your control. And then the, the last thing they did in their analysis here is they use boosted regression trees, which I'm not going to try to explain. <laughs> Um, uh, but they use that to find the relative importance of loss harvesting of the lost harvesting alpha drivers. So they find that investor characteristics like the tax spread, the harvest tax rate, the availability of loss offsetting income, the liquidation strategy, and the cash flows into the portfolio. Those things together explain about 60% of the difference in tax loss harvesting alphas, while the return environment explains about 40%, which is significant. Um, so that's one of my takeaways is like, even if you can identify as the best possible candidate for loss harvesting, 40% of the outcome is going to be explained by the return environment that you happen to get it's completely wow. outside your control. Uh, so they find in their sample that when average returns were 6% or lower, there was a lot of tax alpha available, but when returns were higher, it was much more difficult to generate tax alpha. And there, this is empirical using us data. Um, they also find that to achieve a high tax loss harvesting alpha, investors needed to have an average volatility of at least 17% within the first 12 months 
after making cash contributions to their taxable equity portfolio. And that's part of that 40%. But it's like a lot of stuff has to go right. You have to be making contributions, but the right sequence of returns ha- has to happen after you make the contributions to get the, to get the high alpha. Um, so in the end, they find that the ability to, to tax loss harvest in all return environments with direct indexing was of the clearest added value to investors with a uh, loss offsetting income to taxable equity ratio above 5%. So at least 5% of the value of your taxable portfolio, you have that much per year in uh, taxable capital gains, which you can offset with losses. Uh, Then that includes in the US, the $3,000 of regular income that can be offset with losses. You have to have a meaningful anticipated tax spread. And to reiterate, that will not never be a thing in at least currently won't be a thing in Canada. And the only thing we ever hear about is on, on that, on the spread, is that it might go, it might get negative. It might yeah. go the wrong way if the capital gains inclusion yeah. rate increases. But I don't think we've ever had a discussion in Canada that I've heard on uh, long-term and short-term capital gains, like lowering the rate on long-term gains or anything like that. If we have, I've missed it also. Yeah. Uh, and you have to have a sufficiently high harvest tax rate. And again, in, in their high tax rate case in, in this paper, uh, the tax rate is quite a bit higher than the highest tax rate on capital gains in in Canada. Uh, for other investor types that don't meet those criteria, the authors of this paper suggest that the cost of direct indexing is likely not worth it, but investors may still want to engage in tax loss harvesting using funds since the costs are much lower. They find lower tax alpha for loss harvesting with funds, but they still do find a tax alpha, uh, but with all the same problems. It doesn't work for every investor and it depends on the return environment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a, a big takeaway, and I kind of already mentioned this for me, uh, and this is similar to the last time I looked at this actually, is that the spread in the tax rates and the availability of offsetting income are, are huge inputs to the equation. If you don't have those, you wouldn't do this. Um, so I think it, it makes that case for when does tax loss harvesting as a strategy make sense a very specific niche case that has to be considered carefully. And then the other really eye-opening thing was that the 40% of the outcome is explained by factors totally outside anyone's control. So even if, even if you identify as the perfect candidate for loss harvesting, there's no guarantee of a good outcome and you're paying an additional 30 or 40 basis points in the case of direct indexing, at least, um, in the case of using funds, the cost is, um, is having to choose a loss selling pair that may be suboptimal relative to what you wanted to own. Like even if, if you're using total market index funds, uh, not as bad. Cause like I mentioned earlier, the tracking error between two total market funds is gonna be pretty low. But if you try to use like even dimensional event and, and event as small cap value funds, for example, uh, for a loss selling pair, there could be meaningful tracking error yeah. over, over a short period of time that could blow up any loss harvesting alpha. Um, they, they, they do make an interesting point in favor of, uh, in favor of direct indexing, uh, which is that the probability of getting a good outcome uh, increases because during bull markets, when time series volatility is low, which is what you'd care about if you're loss harvesting with funds, cross-sectional volatility is really the only way to get tax loss harvesting alpha. So if, if, if you happen to invest in a regime where time series volatility is low and it's a bull market where prices are going up, 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 you just won't be able to loss harvest. Whereas if you're in a direct indexing program over that period, you may still be able to get some loss harvesting alpha. Um, so and it, it, it's less effective in those periods, much less effective, but at least you might get something. So that's, that's kind of the, I guess that's not a new argument. It's a, reasonably good argument for the direct indexing though but is it worth the 30 or 40 basis points i'm still i'm still fairly unconvinced especially for our, for a canadian fantastic you'll be happy to know before i go to the book reviews that oscar just barged into my room i think i told you i, I got my printer on a little table here beside me but it's only about maybe eight inches off the floor so he wedges in underneath this table and he gets so caught in there that if something happens in the house that he, he wants to get to it, like someone comes to the door, he ends up tripping over the printer cable and pulls <laughs> off the, he's, he's down here now. So that just happened? He just wedged down, it goes between my legs and wedges down underneath this printer. I don't understand what he's doing, but anyways, he's here for the book reviews. 
So you're good to go with that book reviews. Uh, All right. Ready to go, yeah. Here's some five book, six book reviews for you for uh, Financial Literacy Month. So the first one, Geometry of Wealth, How to Shape a Life of Money and Meeting by our good friend, Brian Portnoy. So Brian is a two-time guest, episode 102 and 126, and founder of the company Shaping Wealth. Brian's got amazing industry experience, many years doing mutual fund research at Morningstar and also worked extensively in the hedge fund world. This book came out in 2018. It's really a book about the relationship between money and meeting. Until you define the purpose of your savings, you're not able to really formulate your priorities. And only once you have your priorities can you actually create a strategy for your investments. And once these steps are in place, you can then start your journey towards what he calls, and this is such a great pairing of words, funded contentment. And I, for me, that Ben, this is the first book that I read that really drove home the concept of having enough and what is the difference between being wealthy and rich. And as Brian says, wealth truly defined is only achievable in the context of a life in which purpose and practice are thoughtfully calibrated. So that's book number one. Book number two, past guest as well, Fred Vitis, Retirement Income for Life, Getting More Without Saving More, second edition. So I wanted to include a book that was for people closer or perhaps into retirement. Fred was a terrific guest on episode 104. Seems so long ago now, but 104. Um, widely regarded as Canada's leading pension expert. This book was released in 2020 as an update to his original 2018 one. So he dives into topics really practically, such as early retirement planning, estate planning, what's the impact of low interest rates, why would you want to defer your CPP, how to think about annuities, and how to draw down your assets in retirement. Excellent resource, lots of practical ideas, and an easy read. So highly recommend Fred's book. The next one, Paul Merriman, another good friend of ours. So he co-wrote a book with Richard Buck called We're Talking Millions, 12 Simple Ways to Supercharge Your Retirement. Paul was a, an excellent guest and is a good friend of ours back in episode 147. And although retired, uh, there's a very large wealth management firm with his name on it out in the Seattle area that he founded many years ago. So this is a 160-page book that is widely available, including a free PDF online. And in fact, at the front end of his PDF, there's links to lots of other free downloads. So if you go to paulmerriman.com, you'll see it there. Or if you can, if you just Google, we're talking millions of PDF pops up right away. Paul is truly out to help people, and that came through in our conversation with him. This book has been dubbed as a simple blueprint for a favorable financial future. Goes through many of the similar points we've talked about before, such as saving, starting early, owning equities, diversification, cut your expenses, index funds, factors, dollar cost averaging, and of course, rebalancing. Another great and again, free resource. Next one from John Bogle, Common Sense on Mutual Funds, New Imperatives for the Intelligent Investor. I'm sure the vast majority of listeners know Jack Bogle legendary force behind Vanguard. So we discussed the amazing mark that he's left on our industry in our, in our conversation with Robin Wigglesworth in episode 184 and also, I don't know, a couple months ago with Gus Sauter in episode 216. To me, the best testament for this book came from William Bernstein who called Bogle's Common Sense on Mutual Funds perhaps, quote, the best introduction to basic finance that ever has been written. So I'm not sure we need any more uh, reason to read it than that. So the original version of this book was written in 1999, and then this one was updated in 2010 with an intro from David Swenson, and it's a great intro, David Swenson of Yale fame. So Bogle's lifetime message was always twofold. Low-cost low index funds are simply a sensible way to invest for most investors, and that the industry is basically out to convince you otherwise. Legendary messages from Vanguard. Uh, Book goes through you know classic topics such as investment strategy, selection, performance, tax inefficiency of many funds, time in the market, and cost matter. Were we the bad guys earlier, convincing people otherwise? I just, we might have been just expanding on the argument. You didn't say they're bad necessarily. Number five: the investment answer. Learn to manage your money and protect your financial future by Dan Goldie and Gordon Murray. So Dan Goldie's a registered investment advisor in California. His co-author, 
Gordon Murray chose to co-write this book in the remaining time he had while he was suffering from glioblastoma. He passed away about the time the book was released back in 2011. The book is 96 pages long, extremely readable, basically breaks down an investor's decisions into five steps. Do you do it yourself or with an advisor? What is an appropriate asset allocation for you? How to diversify your assets? Invest actively or passively? And how to rebalance? So, and this is by luck, but we included this book as was mentioned by our past guest, Dave Getch, which is what I'll be doing a 60 second review of in a little bit. And the last book I wanted to sneak in because I read it this week and I thought it was great and is very Canadian centric was a book by Erica Alini called Money Like You Mean It, Personal Finance Tactics for the Real World. So I discovered this book earlier this week, devoured it in a few mornings. Uh, Erica is the personal finance reporter with the Globe and Mail. I think, Ben, you've done work with her, correct? Yeah, when when she was at uh, Global News, we talked for a bunch of stories, and she put me on TV, surprisingly, <laughs> once or twice. Yeah, so this is a super fresh book targeting Gen Zs. Um, like I said, Canadian-centric, Canadian rules, easy read. Uh, covers off all the big parts of financial planning from managing credit, your credit score, buying a house, retirement planning, investment options, believes in indexing. Just a really great, well-written, a readable package for, for Gen Z. So had to add it in. I know it's number six. So we had five two weeks ago, six this week. And that's a great set of resources. All of them are available. All are affordable. Some are free. So there you go. So we're awesome. Gonna, we're going to try another Good books. We're going to try another uh, one episode in 60 seconds. I failed by 10 oh. seconds two weeks ago. So oh, did you? I did. It was 70 seconds. So apparently I do a clock somewhere. So I don't know where the clock's going to be here, but ready to start the timer? Hold on. I'm, I'm going to time, time you. I'm going to time it. Ready? Yep. Go. Okay, so sitcom writer Dave Getch was our guest on episode 26, and his story is one of true transformation. Uh, Dave grew up worrying about economic uncertainty, and ironically, he ended up with a career in the economically volatile entertainment industry in L.A. area. So Dave was always searching for a solution to shield himself from worry. Then he discovered the book mentioned earlier, The Investment Answer. The book is full of great ideas and new ideas to him. This led him to find a great advisor. The advisor implemented a philosophy that gave him confidence that he craved. Huge dramatic impact on Dave. He became a transformed investor. And he emphasized to us in the episode, if you can stop worrying, you can be better at living the life you want to live. Think about how good that must have felt. And now he wants his friends to have that same feeling. Nice. 47 seconds. Wow. There we go. That was better. Okay. Yeah, that was, a, that, was a, that was a cool episode with Dave. I like Dave. Yeah, the line I should have mentioned as well is, is, is his famous line to me that I use a lot is, you learn to hug uncertainty, hug volatility. So he was great. He's been you great. Could've, you had 13 seconds. You could have fit that in. Yeah, I, I maybe I said, went too fast. Anyways, now we're at the low, low pressure part of the episode for the three of us that still remain. <laughs> okay, I don't know what we're going to call it, but we'll call it today the close. You put a note here about how many times it's been reviewed, and we mentioned this, I don't know, a month or so ago. It would be cool to get above 1,000, but we're up to 907 reviews on Apple Podcasts, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And when you poke around other podcasts, there's not a lot that have that many. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we've been we've been doing the podcast for a while, and a few people listen. So I guess some people left reviews over the last few years. So if you're on it's Apple, crazy, we've been doing the podcast for like for years. That's, four, that's four and a half years. Man, crazy. Yeah. Some very nice reviews. So Casey Janer on Apple Podcasts from the states called this favorite pod. I love this podcast. I'm a nerd, but half the time, okay, more. I'm so confused what they're talking about, but the cadence is so simple, so calm, so geeky. It's the perfect tone to relax to. And after hours of listening, you'll start to learn exclamation mark. I'm starting to really enjoy the financial content now as well. And so really happy to leave a review. Thank you. Very nice. So simple, so calm, Uh, so geeky. 
I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. All right, you do the uh, next one. Bill, Billy VL in Canada said, great show for people interested in personal finance and investing. Great show. Got to say one of my favorites. One ask for the team, can you put the names of the books you review in the show notes? Do we not do that? Angelica said we're going to make sure we do it. Uh, I think we usually do. Maybe the episode Billy listened to. We There's also to. a book list on the RR site of all the books. Have you looked at that yeah, list? Yeah, that's a lot way? of books. Though. It's a lot of books. It's a lot of books. Like, what do you do? What do you do with that list? You go, oh, I, I heard about a book, and you go, there's like 200 books in there or something. <laughs> oh, there's way more than 200. Is there? There's a way more than 200. Well, we should organize that somehow or something. <laughs> what do you even do with that? What's the point at that point? Um, uh, they, they listen to the podcast while driving, so they, they don't have a chance to write the books down, but they want to somewhere to. Yeah, I, I, I thought they were in the show notes if, if, they, if it wasn't. Sorry. So the next one, I'm, I'm happy and I want to talk about this. So Loot666 on Apple in Canada. Amazing interview style. I've been listening for a couple of years and love your focus on happiness and living a good life. Your interview style is the best of any podcast. You effectively ask open-ended questions and you let the guests speak. Your talking points are concise and well presented. It's too common in most other podcasts that the host rambles on with compounding leading questions which hinder the guest's ability to speak about the important or most relevant points. Keep up the good work. You're a shining example of how to execute a podcast, Chris. This is something that we talked about this, that that your style, and you go back and listen to old episodes, you can tell the questions get shorter, shorter, shorter. And now, I'm not sure we ever butt in. You go and listen to other podcasts, and this listener is right. You often get that preamble and compound questions and then you wonder as a listener, how is the person going to answer? Like, because they're two separate questions that have been bundled. It's like, just keep it short and let them speak. And we are very deliberate about that. Yep. That's something that we've, we've tried. We always try to make the questions as short as possible. No compound questions and open-ended questions. Those are all things we try to do. We've also gotten feedback in the opposite direction saying that some people wish we would, it would interrupt sometimes. But it, I always find those are like, Someone with a very, very specific point of view on something is like, why didn't you push back on this thing? It's like, I don't know, man. I don't share your point of view. That's why. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it it tick it tick her on Apple Podcast Canada. I mean, this is we should we should just send this to John Cochran. This is for him, not for us. <laughs> what an excellent. <laughs> What an excellent review of economic theory. John delivers outstanding insight to economics. What a learning opportunity for anyone who's looking to understand modern economics. Yes, we agree. We agree. Uh, I got a nice email. I've been pondering this message for a while, but my three-month-old has been keeping me busy. I'm an RR listener and a fan since late 2018, so in all modesty, I think I can claim to be part of the early audience. This past summer, you guys shared some negative feedback you received on the podcast. For me, it was a trigger to decide to write you a message. And it seems like you read and appreciate the message you get. So here goes. To be honest, I don't get any of the negative feedback. The crypto series, for example, I don't know how much more transparent and clear you could have made this. If you're not interested, just skip it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I saw there, okay. I mean, I, the people. I, I think some people just don't pay attention to what's happening maybe and then form opinions based on that. But there was a... Every now and then I see our podcast show up in, in Reddit threads where someone's like, this happens, it's like once every couple of months someone posts on Reddit, what are your favorite financial podcasts? And everyone suggests they're probably, these threads, it's like, there, there should only be one of those. Why do you need to have a new one every few months? But anyway, they come up frequently enough. And I'm always grateful that our podcast is often mentioned, but in the most recent one of these that I saw on Personal Finance Canada, that happened. Someone says rational reminder, and then someone else says that it's it's gone downhill in the last year. And then someone else is like, what do you mean it's gone downhill? Like, I didn't notice anything. And the person who had said that initially said, well, well half their episodes are on crypto now. <laughs> and then someone was like, yeah, but they started a separate series. It's like not, it's not related to the podcast at all. You can just skip those episodes. Anyway, it's just, it's funny that people... Got upset about that. And this person carries on. It's clearly labeled in the podcast feed. Another criticism you right. seem to have gotten is that not every episode is on hardcore finance topic, but honestly, 
I can't imagine a better mix of subjects and guests. For me, all the evolutions and subjects have been without friction. I guess I'm just evolving together with the flow of the podcast. Okay, occasionally there's a guest or subject, which is not my favorite episode, but I suppose that's just life. Yeah, it is. Uh, So I've been thinking about how to express how much I value the podcast, and I've settled on the following. I would pay a subscription fee to get access in exchange for my Netflix account, although I'm not sure my wife would agree. However, I hope you don't try and monetize the content because new listeners might find it hard harder to discover. Just to illustrate the impact of your content in my quest for a good life, we've hired a cleaning person, buying time, gone to one car, and I'm taking up kayaking this spring to tilt towards more outdoors and healthy factors. I hope I don't, nice come, tilt. Off, I hope I don't come off too strong as a fanboy, but I just wanted to express my gratitude for all the content you created, and we find it terrible if what I'm sure can't be more than a vocal minority would cause you to stop the RR podcast. That's from MH in Brussels. We have no plans to monetize the podcast. We're not going to put up a paywall. That's not no paywall. Place. We've we've tossed around the idea of uh, of a Patreon because that's not the first time someone has said that. Like, um, I want to give you guys money, and we we that's not why we're doing the podcast. But uh, if if it makes people feel good, maybe it, maybe it's interesting. I don't know. Anyway, so that's something we've talked about. Not monetizing the podcast, not making a paywall, not even making any special Patreon content. No, no. But just setting up a Patreon. Yeah, people want to kick in because it does cost money. It's a a pretty big organization now to pull it off. So who knows where that will go. Yeah. Um, The podcast, the the, the cost of producing the podcast is no joke. And maintaining the community and all that stuff around it, it's uh, it's quite quite the thing. As always, connect with us. We're both on LinkedIn. I'm probably more active in connecting on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out, drop me a note anytime. We're both on Twitter, as is Rash Reminder, CP313 on Peloton, and also hashtag Rash Reminder on Peloton. And Rash Reminder is on Instagram. And there's a lot more reels coming out now too, which are pretty cool if you're into reels. <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. If you're into that kind of thing. Ben, anything else this week? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I um I, I, I have I have some cool ideas for future episodes on um I I've been doing this financial planning course for for Quebec. It's like in, in Canada, one province, Quebec has has real proper tight regulation over the profession of financial planning. And because I moved to Quebec, I wanted to I don't know. I don't have to do this, but I'm doing the financial planning certification course in Quebec. And they have phenomenally good, well-developed content on what the financial planning process should look like. Anyway, so doing, doing this study has given me tons of, tons of good ideas for future episodes with more of a financial planning focus. So I think that should be, should be fun. I don't know if that's this year or, or early next year, but they'll be coming. Yeah, we're kicking around ideas around the goal survey as well, which is so cool. All right. As always, everybody, thanks for listening.